Restraints and solitary confinement are forms of torture. To some, the act of institutionalization itself is an act of torture, where even if not physically, mechanically, or chemically restrained, one is subjected to solitary confinement from the free world, often with no crime committed. The Utica State Lunatic Asylum is, among other things, the birthplace of the American Psychiatric Association's American Journal of Psychiatry, which was originally named the American Journal of Insanity, when the association was called the Association of Medical Superintendents of American Insane Institutions. The association supported a theory called moral treatment, which in practice was forced labor as treatment, or slavery. Under the moral treatment model, supposed lunatics worked in the shops or on the farms to calm their insanities. In the inaugural year of the asylum's operations, the asylum manager logs included the 1844 report to the New York State Assembly, where it was written, in conveying a patient to the asylum, let it be done by force rather than deception. There was little dispute that asylums were places where one would be held against one's will. In the first volume of the Journal of Insanity in 1844, a warning not to replicate the European asylum models of institutions exclusively for the insane, for which they suggested Dante's lines on the gates of hell might well be inscribed. Leave hope behind, all ye who enter here, was printed. However, in the manager's logs, it was clear the warning was not heeded. What was reported in the 1844 manager logs to the New York State Legislature were the needs of the asylum that were realized by the managers only after the operation of the asylum commenced. The asylum's manager's request for support in 1844 included the need for access to water from the Erie Canal which more than a decade later, when the asylum was set ablaze by William Spears on Bastille Day, July 14, 1857, would prove fatal for not having been met. The warnings in the Journal of Insanity in 1844 about not replicating the asylum model in Europe were not heeded or reflected in the asylum manager logs and report to the New York State Legislature in 1844 which included some great insights about the needs of the asylum that were realized only after operation commenced. These requests for consideration included the need for access to water from the Erie Canal, a heating system, and rooms were to be provided for the most noisy and violent patients. This was a point that was hit home to the legislature as part of the goal of the report was to acquire more resources to further develop the building. The managers wrote, it is also desirable that other accommodations for the more noisy and violent class of patients should be provided. That class are now placed in the basement of the present building where we have fitted rooms that are entirely comfortable, but it is found that they disturb and annoy by their noise the, those in the halls above. The present building was originally intended for only the convalescent class, a class who are comparatively orderly and quiet. Organized hospitals for the insane have separate accommodations for the noisy and violent class, and so far removed as not to disturb those who are quiet. In the preceding paragraph in the report, the managers wrote, the washing and ironing is done in the basement of the center part of the present building, but the rooms used for that purpose are too small and badly lighted, and we are fully convinced that both the health and comfort of the inmates above require that the washing for so large a family should be removed to a place without the present building. The asylum's managers were asking the New York State Legislature for tax dollars to create new institutions on the grounds of the Utica State Lunatic Asylum for the noisy and violent class of patients to be moved out of the asylum along with the laundry. They argued the rooms in the basement were too small and badly lighted for the use of laundry, but in the basement of the same building they fitted rooms that are entirely comfortable for the noisy and violent class of patients, who they still wanted to move elsewhere. As early as the 1843 report, there were statements to the legislature about the use of the basement for inmates. 
The basement of the wings serves for storerooms and hot air furnaces, and a small part at the extremity has been properly fitted up for the temporary accommodation of a few of the most violent and noisy patients. The experiences of those forced into commitment are rarely published. Fall number 12, of which Phoebe Davis wrote, is an example. There is a hall in that house away off by itself, which they call number 12, and in which there are six cells. When a patient gets there, I believe it is considered the greatest punishment allowable. But they went one degree further with me. I was sent to the hospital water closet and received my meals in bed there. In 1855, Davis claimed she was locked in a water closet for three days and was forced to take her meals there. The asylum manager logs state, the water closets and washing and bathing rooms from long use and decay absolutely require thorough renovation at a considerable expense. The improvement can no longer be delayed with propriety. Restraints and seclusion were the subject of Brigham's 1844 report to the legislature on behalf of the managers of the Utica State Lunatic Asylum. Brigham starts off the report by acknowledging the lack of strong rooms as a problem and states that by lining some of the rooms with boards and making stronger doors, we have made some of the rooms safe and comfortable for this class, but we have no cells or dungeons. Every patient has a good sized room, well ventilated and warmed. The Utica State Lunatic Asylum established to be a place free of restraints actually was not restraint free. By its own reports, the asylum used restraints in solitary confinement. Brigham explained that solitary confinement in one of these rooms lasted for as long as it took for the inmate to gain control, and that this confinement was the chief restraint employed in the institution. However, the next paragraph in the report details different types of mechanical restraints and includes the statement that leather and cloth mittens and leather muffs and wristbands are our only means of restraint. Brigham continues, we have never had a straight jacket or a restraining chair in the asylum, though we probably should have used the latter occasionally had we had one. We believe that sometimes restraint of this kind is far better for patients than to permit them to exhaust and injure themselves by their incessant exertions or to have them restrained by the hands of attendants. But no restraint except for the moment is permitted here unless the express order of one of the officers of the house. Among our printed rules for the conduct of the attendants are the following, to which we believe they strictly adhere. The attendant is never to apply any restraining apparatus, such as muffs, mitts, and etc., unless by order of a resident officer. Other methods of gaining control over the inmates in the institution were explained by Brigham in a positive light including the warm bath, long continued has this effect, and cold applied to the head, especially showering the head with cold water. Medicines, sometimes laxatives have this effect, and also narcotics and opiates. In 1855, Phoebe Davis also discussed the baths in terms of retribution inmates were subject to by their keepers if the inmate filed grievances of the staff with the doctors. The physician would not more get out of the halls before the help would say, now look out madam for next bathing day. That meant holding them under the water just as long as they dared and more than once too. The bathing troughs are cast iron and very heavy and one would be surprised to see the marks of that iron trough on the limbs of patients between the foot and knee joints. There was generally the variety of colors and shades such as usually accompany bruises. On a number of patients I saw, it was frightful to look at them. At first I did not comprehend it, and I asked them the cause. They told me it was the effect of being pushed against the bathing troughs and the bedsteads. The Utica State Lunatic Asylum is sometimes held as a place that was built to be a restraint-free environment under the guise of moral treatment. However, the Utica crib, one of the most barbaric restraining devices of the 19th century, 
which was positioned as a humane alternative to what was then available, was invented at the Utica State Lunatic Asylum. The Utica crib was specifically discussed as a positive alternative to being tied with bed straps directly to a bed by the asylum managers to the New York State Legislature in 1856. The other method, and which we greatly prefer, is a covered bed. This bed is constructed like an ordinary child's crib with the addition of a slatted cover. This arrangement does not interfere with the movements of the patient in rolling from one side of the bed to the other or moving the limbs in any way. It merely prevents the patient from sitting up or getting out of bed. As the sides and top are open, the air circulates as freely about the body of the patient as in an ordinary bed. Restraint in a horizontal position is used in cases of exhaustion, where the physical health of the patient demands that he be kept in bed. The medical thought involved is readily appreciated. Sick people ordinarily lie in bed under the advice and direction of the physician. But the same class, when insane, will not always do so. And these arrangements are to affect this end. Phoebe Davis in 1855 who had been locked up at the Utica State Lunatic Asylum earlier, also discussed with great detail what she and others in the cells of the basement of the Utica State Lunatic Asylum and the kinds of tortures crib patients kept in the basement were subjected to in the asylum. Davis explained, they had to give me medicine for a cough I had in consequence of taking cold in the cells and in the water closet. I was obliged to have the window up all of the time. It was late in the fall, cold and rainy, and no fire could reach me. I stayed in that place and in the cells most of the time for three weeks. And when I was in the cell some of the time, I had no bed clothes on my bed except some torn blankets, and they were very filthy at that. They were what some called Indian blankets. I kept what clothes I had upon me and got into the straw just as hogs do in a cold night. The straw was damp, but that was the best I could do with what I had to keep house. The patients who lodge in the cells are generally so filthy that it is necessary to fill the beds with new straw every morning and rain or shine, the beds are drawn through the yard. What private family would think a straw bed fit to sleep on in that condition without a mattress? But crib patients, all of them, are put on that damp straw as soon as it is taken into the house. This is Mental American Monster, the sprawl of American psychiatry. www.mentalamericanmonster.org. Follow us on Facebook, Mental American Monster, and on social media and YouTube. If you'd like to be part of this documentary process, contact me, Lauren Tenney, at 516-319 four two nine five until next time